the lecture, okay? Give me a second, I, I started transmission in YouTube too. Sí, disculpa, algo pasa, perdona. Si quieres empiezo yo a compartir, no hay problema. Sí, compártelo tú porque tengo un problema. Ya, vale, perfecto. Vamos a compartir entonces, deja de compartir pantalla tú, Luis. Vamos a um, compartir sonido, compartir el de video, compartir. ¿Logran ver ustedes la, el video o no? No. Por favor. Confírmeme, José Luis, que estás viendo mi video. José Luis, ¿me escuchas? Estoy tratando a ver algo de, de la proyección, pero no... Ok, ahí está. ¿Están viendo el video? Sí. Ah, espera, espera, espera. Eh... ¿Sí? Sí, nada más el sonido. Faltaría el sonido. A ver. Uh, a ver, voy a dejar de compartir, voy a ver qué pasa con el sonido, porque lo tengo todo. Hola, mi nombre es Dan Gold, y estoy hablando. Sí, sí, ya se escucha algo. Ya se escucha algo. Sobre mis wiggles y jiggles. Todo lo que quieres saber sobre ellos, y un poco más. En un segundo, ¿puedo verlo yo? Vamos a tener fun juntos. And uh, it's going to be 60 minutes of uh, nothing Disculpen but videos segundo, and and con el and tema Let's go. Dame All right. Me. So ocelopsia, yeah, visual consequence of wiggles and jiggles. What does that look like? What is it? What is nice stack? Um, comienzo yo ahora. Pero ah, comienzas tú? Vale, perfecto. Muy bien. Vale. Empieza nomás eh, José Luis. Está listo. Me confirma si se ve. Eh, Eloisa, ¿puedes ver que esté, se esté viendo bien lo de José Luis? Sí, se ve. Sí, se está viendo bien. Perfecto, muy bien. Hola, mi nombre es Dan Gold, y voy a estar hablando por los próximos 60 minutos sobre nystagmus y otros wiggles y jiggles. Todo lo que quería saber sobre ellos y un poco más. Así que se espera conmigo, vamos a tener una fun together. And uh, it's going to be 60 minutes of uh, nothing but videos and, and jiggles and wiggles. Let's go. All right. So oscillopsia, visual consequence of wiggles and jiggles. What does that look like? What is it? What is nystagmus? Okay, it's nystagmus. Now what? What are some clinically important examples or causes of jerk nystagmus? And what about pendular nystagmus? All right, and here's for the, the, the more advanced um, nystagmus portion of, of the presentation. I'm ready to become a nystagmologist. Tell me more. Oscillopsia. So this is so-called walking oscillopsia. It's head movement dependent. And for the patient who has bilateral vestibular loss, it's as if um, the eyes are moving with the head each step. So this is me walking around the Maryland Zoo with my camera on my head. And this is what somebody with bilateral vestibular loss would see. The world would jump and bounce with each head movement because the vestibulo-ocular reflexes cannot, cannot keep the eyes stable. That's walking oscillopsia. Compared to sitting oscillopsia, so here the head's not moving, but the eyes are usually moving. The eyes are usually what's responsible for the nystagma, for the um, 
for, for the jiggling for the oscillopsia, usually due to nystagmus or oscillations. This is head movement independent. Again, the head is still, the eyes are moving, so-called sitting oscillopsia. So what is nystagmus? So first of all, we always want to aim the fovea, the back part of the eye, this is the 2020 best seeing part of the eye at whatever it is that we're looking at, at the visual target, at the, the object of regard. So with nystagmus, and there are different forms, the slow phase of the jiggle or the wiggle moves that fovea away from fixation, moves that fovea away from whatever it is that we want to look at. So in each case, whether it's pendular nystagmus or whether it's jerk nystagmus, jerk is a slow phase followed by a fast phase, a slow phase followed by a fast phase, a slow phase followed by a fast phase, um, as compared to pendular, which is a slow phase followed by a slow phase followed by a slow phase that resolve, re, um, resembles a, a pendulum. Um, in both situations, the slow phase is the culprit. The slow phase is the problem. That's what's moving the fovea, your 2020 vision, away from whatever it is that you want to be looking at. Compare that to these intrusions or oscillations where the saccade is the culprit. The saccade is what moves the fovea away from fixation. Here we can see this is fixation. This is the spot where the patient's looking. All of a sudden, there's a saccade that moves the eyes away from fixation. Um, the patient's brain realizes that it's now away from fixation, makes the saccade back until there's another saccade that moves the eyes away from fixation, moves the fovea away from whatever it is that, that the patient wants to look at. These are called square wave jerks. These are by far the most common form of saccadic intrusion, um, so-called because of their appearance, their waveform um, with during eye movement recordings and we're going to talk a little bit. I'll show you an example of macro saccadic oscillations. These are pretty rare. Opsoclonus and flutter, this is very characteristic. I'll show you an example of this. But in these situations, it's a saccade, a saccade, a saccade. Here it's saccade, 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 saccade. So in this situation, there's no intersaccadic interval. That's what can distinguish opsoclonus flutter from these other intrusions. Um, and oscillations, which do have an intersaccadic interval. So there's a saccade, there's a, a moment of sort of, um, of the, the eyes being quiet, then there's a saccade, there's a, a moment of the eyes being quiet, um, et cetera. So let's compare. So this is nystagmus, this is jerk nystagmus. Again, there's a fast phase, there's a slow phase, there's a fast phase. In this situation, it's a slow phase down and a fast phase up. This is upbeat nystagmus. This just happens to be a, an upbeat nystagmus due to an acute Wernicke's encephalopathy from thiamine deficiency. Compare that to pendular. Again, here is a slow phase followed by a fast phase. Here's a slow phase followed by a slow phase followed by a slow phase. This is an example of a patient with oculopalatal tremor. Pendular nystagmus is far more rare than jerk nystagmus. When you do see it, you should think about oculopaudal tremor, among other conditions, which we'll talk about. What about saccadic intrusions? Here's an example of ocular flutter. Again, all of a sudden, there's a saccade, 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 saccade. So here, the saccade is the culprit. Up here, that slow phase was the culprit, okay? This was a post-infectious ocular flutter. Nystagmus, again, I said this 18 times already, I'll say it a 19th time, blame the slow phase. Intrusion or oscillation, blame the saccade. That's the difference. What about this? Now we can see square waves. We see the patient's looking at fixation, all of a sudden the eyes go over here, then they come back. This is a, a more prominent example and a patient with Friedrich's ataxia where she has a lot of square wave jerks. Here's an example in a patient with uh, progressive supranuclear palsy where square waves are really common and really prominent. Here's a patient with sort of so-called square wave um, oscillations because they just keep going, square wave, square wave, square wave, square wave, but there's always an intersaccadic interval, so that's not flutter. These are called macro square waves. These are just square waves that are larger in amplitude than you would typically expect. And next, we'll see an example of macro saccadic oscillations. 
And this, what's happening basically here is a saccade, that straddling fixation. It's going too far, it's going too far, it's going too far. And it's very hard for that patient to get back to fixation, usually um, associated with pretty significant saccadic dysmetria as well. Square wave jerks common, macro saccadic oscillations um, and, and macro square waves are not common, okay? So again, saccadic intrusions, all of these examples that I just showed you are different um, intrusions. In, in each case, the saccade is the culprit, not nystagmus. It's not, none of those examples I just showed you are nystagmus. Remember, square wave jerks are common, especially as people age, especially in Parkinson's disease and progressive supranuclear palsy, but also cerebellar disorders. And it's all about the company that it keeps. So. If somebody has um, a, a Parkinson's disease and has square, wakes, square wave jerks, they're also gonna have mass facies and, and some rigidity and some postural instability and some tremor, for instance. If there's a cerebellar disorder that's causing square waves, that patient probably is gonna have uh, limb or gait ataxia, gaze evoke nystagmus and lateral gaze. So it's all about the company that it keeps. Remember that you can have physiologic nystagmus. Here's an example of an optokinetic stimulus, an optokinetic flag or tape. And this patient has normal slow phases, that's pursuit, and fast phases, those are saccades. And this is an example of a physiologic nystagmus, an optokinetic nystagmus. This is perfectly normal. In the virtual world, you can do this as well, which I really like, is, is um, taking a, an iPhone app and holding it up to the to the camera and for the patient, it's basically a full field optokinetic stimulus, kind of similar, but not exactly the same as looking out the window of a train, for instance, as you can see over here. So at the bedside, when we see this optokinetic nystagmus, basically you're looking at pursuit, slow phases and saccades, the fast phases, because it's not really a full field um, stimulus like it would be if you were looking out the window of a train. This is an example of jerk nystagmus. So a linear constant slow phase velocity. And again, the slow phase is the culprit. The slow phase is moving the fovea, moving the eyes to the left, and then that's followed by a fast phase to the right. So it's nystagmus is a little confusing because it's named after the fast phase, even though the slow phase is the pathologic phase, okay? So if this were a vestibular neuritis, it would be a left-sided neuritis, the slow phase drifting toward the paretic ear, but it's a right-beating nystagmus because it's named after the fast phase. So this is a patient with the acute vestibular syndrome. If a patient has acute prolonged vestibular nystagmus and vertigo, basically the differential diagnosis there is vestibular neuritis or a stroke. This is the, the perfect um, patient to, to use the HINTS exam on. Um, and in the hands of subspecialists, it, it's very good at, at distinguishing a peripheral from a central. What about this? This patient has gaze of oak nystagmus, right beating and right, but then when she looks back to center, it's left beating, that's rebound. Left beating and left. And then she comes back to center and it's right beating. It just changed direction again. So this is a, a nice example of gaze of oak nystagmus in a patient with cerebellar ataxia, right beating nystagmus and right, and watch it move to left beating all of a sudden, that's the rebound. And now left beating and left gaze, that's the gaze evoked. And then it comes back to center and it's right beating, that's the rebound again, okay? Um, this, it doesn't matter so much because this, you can tell what's gaze evoked, what's rebound at the bedside from a, a clinical standpoint, it doesn't really matter so much that this is a velocity decreasing waveform um, or a slow phase velocity, but if, if you were to do a nice dedicated eye movement recordings, you might see this, this velocity decreasing slow phase velocity. But if you see this degree of direction changing, this gaze evoked nystagmus with rebound, this is pathologic. So people can have a physiologic end gaze nystagmus endpoint nystagmus. When they look out far to the right, they can have a couple beats of right beating. When they look far to the left, they can have a couple beats of left beating. But it should fatigue after a couple seconds. Um, it, the amplitude shouldn't be that significant. It should be relatively subtle. And when you bring that patient back to sort of a three-quarters position, 
it should go away. And when you bring them back to, to primary gaze, you shouldn't see rebound nystagmus. If you do, that's pathologic. All right, so this is jerk. This is two kinds of jerk here. This is a vestibular jerk in left gaze. This is um, a vestibular schwannoma, right vestibular schwannoma. So if you had, if you had a vestibular nystagmus that's due to vestibular loss, again, the slow phase um, is going to, to drift back toward the paretic ear. So here, the patient has lost their vestibular function on the right side. So you would expect to see left beating nystagmus in accordance with Alexander's law. That left beating nystagmus is going to be more prominent when the patient looks to the left contralesional to the, the um, to the, in this case, the vestibular schwannoma. So this is an example of a left beating nystagmus in far left gaze due to a right vestibular loss. And again, the vestibular nystagmus has a linear or constant slow phase velocity. But in the same patient, watch what happens when he looks toward the side of the lesion. Now this is Ipsy lesional, and now he has a different kind of nystagmus. This is gaze evoked. You can see that the amplitude is a little bit larger, it's lower frequency. This is a nice example of so called Brun's nystagmus, where you see a gaze evoked nystagmus looking toward the lesion. You see a vestibular nystagmus looking away from the lesion. Um, Brun's nystagmus, typically due to a, a cerebro um, or a cerebellopontine angle tumor like a vestibular schwannoma. And now we have pendular nystagmus. So this is rare, jerk nystagmus is far more common, but again, you can see this sort of back-to-back -back slow phases, and this is pretty fast, but essentially it's slow phase, slow phase, slow phase, slow phase, giving it this pendular appearance. You can't clearly say that there's a slow phase followed by a fast phase here. It's just the same thing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and it looks like a pendulum. So again, this is a form of nystagmus, therefore the slow phase is the culprit. This is pendular nystagmus. Usually this is related to multiple sclerosis, as in this case, or oculopalatal tremor. I showed you an example of that before, and we'll, we'll compare and contrast those two conditions uh, in a bit. All right, so you've decided that the slow phase is the culprit, it's nystagmus, now what do you do? So is it jerk? nystagmus. If it is jerk, then you want to know if it changes direction with the viewing eye. Um, and if it does, meaning that if you cover the left eye and the patient's looking with the right eye and it's right beating, and now you cover the right eye and the patient's looking with the left eye, it's left beating. That's latent nystagmus. That's a benign condition. That's related. That is lifelong. That is not anything to be concerned about. That's why I have it in green here. Or what if it's unidirectional, meaning that it's, it's right beating in all directions of gaze. I put it in yellow because that still could be central or peripheral. Or what about direction changing on lateral gaze? That, that is typically something that is, that is of concern. So again, right beating and right gaze, left beating and left gaze. So unidirectional, if it's a constant velocity, slow phase velocity, um, vestibular nystagmus typically is going to be what's unidirectional. If it's direction changing on lateral gaze, then you're concerned about acquired gaze evoked nystagmus, um, oftentimes in association with rebound nystagmus. Or if it's, if it's um, changing direction on lateral gaze, don't forget about infantile nystagmus. So even if you're seeing a patient in their 20s or 30s um, and they are not experiencing any oscillopsia and it seems like the nystagmus that you're seeing is incidental, Certainly you want to ask about their history. Do they know you're looking at them and their eyes are jumping? Do they know about that? And if so, how long has that been present for? Infantile nystagmus, like latent nystagmus, these are, are long-standing, lifelong problems that are almost certainly unrelated to why you are seeing them. All right, so if it is a vestibular nystagmus, a constant velocity, um, and it's unidirectional, again, that can still be central or peripheral. Um, so if it's central, certainly if you see pure torsional or if you see mixed torsional and vertical, or if you see pure torsional, those are all concerning. 
For peripheral, for an acute uh, vestibular neuritis, really what you're going to see is this sort of mixed horizontal torsional, um, or you may see sort of days later, weeks later, maybe you don't appreciate that torsional component so much, but you can still see a little bit of the horizontal component. Um, it suppresses with fixation, it increases with fixation removed with Frenzel goggles, for instance, and it should follow Alexander's law. So if there's a right beating nystagmus, that right beating nystagmus should increase in right gaze. These are characteristics of a peripheral vestibular as compared to a central peripheral. I'm sorry, a central vestibular. Okay, so what about pendular? Still the slow phase is the culprit. What are some conditions that you should consider? So acquired conditions such as multiple sclerosis, such as oculopaudal tremor, Although infantile nystagmus, we mentioned that before, that can be direction changing. Um, it can be right beating and right gaze and left beating and left gaze, but there can also, there often is a pendular component to the nystagmus as well. So it's mixed. So at times it's pendular, at times it's jerk. When you see that, um, ask the patient about their history and, and certainly consider the possibility that that is infantile nystagmus. What about seesaw nystagmus? This is an uncommon condition. Um, if it's acquired, um, I'll show you a slide on this, that that's concerning, that that is related to neurologic disease. Sometimes people can have an infantile or a congenital nystagmus with a seesaw component. Um, but again, typically the patients, you're, you're aware of that history that the eyes have been jumping and jiggling for, for a period of time. You might appreciate a bit of a seesaw component to it and Whipple's um, disease. So there's this characteristic oculomasticatory myorrhythmia. They can have a pendular nystagmus with a convergence divergence um, characteristic. So both eyes come together, they sort of converge and then they diverge and then they converge and then they diverge. Um, but that is a form of pendular nystagmus, pretty characteristic and pretty uncommon. All right, can't fall asleep yet, we just started. Nystagmus, initiated by the slow phase. I don't know how many times I've said that already, but it is important. Jerk is common. Think about gaze evoke. Think about vestibular nystagmus, such as uh, vestibular neuritis. Pendular, this is rare, but when you see it, um, and you will see it at some point, think about multiple sclerosis and think about oculopaudal tremor. Saccadic intrusions and oscillations, these are initiated by the saccade. The saccade moves the eyes away from that target. Square way jerks are very common. In the aging population, they become more common, but certainly if you see more of them, think about Parkinson's, think about progressive supranuclear palsy, think about a cerebellar disorder. Um, and it's important because recognizing what it is allows you to localize and consider um, specific etiologies. And some of these patterns are really characteristic, like the Whipple's uh, disease. Jerk nystagmus. So what are some clinically important examples? This is a, a nice video from Dr. John Carey of a patient with superior canal dehiscence syndrome, where a loud sound in the right ear um, causes vertigo and causes nystagmus. This nystagmus is in the plane of the right, um, the right anterior or superior semicircular canal. Um, in these patients, certainly ask about pressure or sound-induced vertigo or oscillopsy attacks. Ask about autophony. Do they hear internal noises, things that they shouldn't hear, like hearing their eyes move or hearing their footsteps because there's a, a dehiscent canal and there's an abnormal transmission of sound and pressure. What about jerk nystagmus? So, here, go back. So here's an example of, of a, a, an upbeat torsional nystagmus, a, a right posterior canal, BPPV, because there's otoconia floating around in the right posterior canal. And when you perform a right Dix Hall Pike, the right posterior canal is stimulated. In this case, it's an excitatory problem. If you stimulate the right posterior canal, that's going to cause both of the eyes to depress and both of the eyes to move, um, to rotate toward the left ear, but you see the opposite of that. And that's because the slow phase 
initiates the movement. The slow phase is, is in an excitatory direction, but then the fast phase is in the opposite direction. So the fast phase here is upbeat and torsional toward the right ear, whereas the slow phase was downward um, with a rotation toward the left ear, okay? So likewise, um, if you stimulate um, or inhibit one of the horizontal canals, then you're going to affect the medial rectus and the lateral rectus so that both eyes are going to move conjugately either to the right or to the left. And here in his left horizontal canal, he's got some otoconia floating around. This is a geotropic horizontal canal, BPPV again, that is due to stimulation of the horizontal canal. In this direction, it's excitatory. The, the left horizontal canal is excited. And with the right ear down, um, it is inhibited. The otoconia are moving in an inhibitory direction. So in the plane of the affected canal, that is characteristic of BPPV, you'll see upbeat torsional toward the lowermost or affected ear with posterior canal BPPV with horizontal nystagmus, I'm sorry, with horizontal nystagmus, geotropic or apogeotropic with horizontal canal BPPV. So this patient has a right vestibulopathy. So here you can see a nice mixed horizontal torsional left beating nystagmus that increases in left gaze in accordance with Alexander's law. Clearly in right gaze, it's still left beating horizontal and torsional. So this is unidirectional. And essentially what creates this asymmetry is the right side of the vestibular system is lesioned is hypoactive and you have sort of unopposed um, tone coming from the left side and that's going to push the eyes to the right paretic ear, that's the slow phase and then the fast phase is gonna be in the opposite direction, a left beating nystagmus. If you summate um, these, these upward and downward and, and um, horizontal components and the torsional components, that's why you see that mixed horizontal torsional nystagmus that's so common with acute vestibular neuritis, for instance. So um, unidirectional, Alexander's law, mixed horizontal torsional fixation suppresses, and if you put this patient in the dark, remove fixation, oftentimes you're gonna see even more nystagmus. This patient has downbeat nystagmus, so there's a constant slow phase drift upwards followed by a fast downward movement. This patient has spinocerebellar ataxia type eight. And when you see downbeat nystagmus, usually you're thinking about a, a cerebellar flocculus or paraflocculus lesion, um, associated ocular motor abnormalities, typically psychotic pursuit, as well as gaze evoked nystagmus. Or it may just be positional. So this patient really had very little downbeat nystagmus when she was upright, but when you put her down into a straight head hanging position or a right or left exalt, like there was a lot of downbeat. And this is a patient with a cerebellar degeneration. So it's a good idea to, to see how these provocative maneuvers, such as the positional maneuvers, change or provoke um, different patterns of nystagmus and then try to figure out what it is. When you see downbeat positional nystagmus, you should be concerned um, about uh, a cerebellar disorder rather than a BPPV. This patient has um, upbeat nystagmus. This is the patient I showed with uh, Wernicke's encephalopathy due to thiamine deficiency. Slow phase down followed by a fast phase up. And when you see this, you're thinking about the brainstem, the midline brainstem, the dorsal medulla, for instance, um, is one localization. Think about Wernicke's acutely, and, and please give IV thiamine um, because you don't want to miss that opportunity. If, if you wait for a thiamine level to come back or for other tests to come back, um, you may have missed your chance to help this patient. What about torsional nystagmus? So again, you're thinking about the brainstem typically when you see pure torsional nystagmus. Think about the medulla, think about um, midbrain structures as well that can produce 
secure torsional nystagmus, rostral, interstitial, medial longitudinal fasciculus, the interstitial nucleus of the hall as well. Take a look at one of your favorite conjunctival blood vessels and, and watch it. And so clearly you can see that, that the top holes of both eyes are always toward the right ear. This is sort of unidirectional the camera. in all directions, but a, a pure torsional nystagmus. This is another example of patient seen in the emergency department. A little bit farther to the left. And she had an almost exclusively pure torsional nystagmus. She did have an abnormal head impulse to the right as well. Although you can have an abnormal head impulse with some stroke syndrome, right. some central localizations. But this was unidirectional. Look up and even in right gaze, it was still a little bit left beating, the torsion in particular. Look down at the floor. And interesting, Ollie, interestingly, although this patient's nystagmus is, is almost pure That's torsional, right. a little bit of a left beat component, um, she did have a peripheral etiology. This is a patient who had sickle cell and she had a labyrinthine hemorrhage. So depending on how you affect the various semicircular canals, you can technically get a peripheral pure torsional nystagmus. It's just hard to do. You have to strategically pick off this semicircular canal and that semicircular canal. It's much easier to do if you're talking about a central etiology, a central problem, um, because all those fibers are, are so close together as they enter the medulla as they, they um, make their way to the vestibular nucleus. So when you see pure torsional, um, consider it central until proven otherwise. Usually you're thinking about the brain stem, as I mentioned, with exceptions. All right, so anytime somebody shows you a video of somebody with horizontal nystagmus and they just keep making you watch it, it's almost always gonna be periodic alternating nystagmus, so there's a left beating nystagmus but it's slowing down, it's slowing down, it's slowing down, it stopped, null period, and now it's beating in the opposite direction. Now it's right beating. So it was left beating for 90 to 120 seconds, then there was a null period where it stopped, and then it alternated, it transitioned over to a right beating nystagmus. When you see that, Think about periodic alternating nystagmus, PAN. This patient had a cerebellar degeneration. This is why anybody, unless they, they have the acute vestibular syndrome in the emergency department and they have spontaneous nystagmus, uh, basically anybody else, if they have horizontal nystagmus, you want to sit there and look at it for 90 to 120 seconds to see if it transitions to, to or reverses um, in the opposite direction. Um, at the very least, take a look at it a bunch of different times throughout the evaluation if for whatever reason you can't spare 90 to 120 seconds. And if at some point it's left beating and at another point it's right beating, think about PAN. If your resident or fellow says it's right beating and you're looking at them now, 10 minutes later and it's left beating, think about PAN in that patient as well. All right, so we talked about the, the, the period of 90 to 120 seconds. We talked about the null period. When you see this, this, is, this highly localizes to the cerebellar nodulus and uvula. And don't forget about baclofen because baclofen can be really helpful for this disorder. All right, so this patient has downbeat nystagmus and some square waves, so you can see both of them. And here's some gaze evoked and downbeat giving it a side pocket appearance, but then the gaze evoked stops and then it reverses. So now it's right beating. She's still looking to the left though. And now clearly there's the rebound nystagmus. So the point here is that there's left beating and downward. Again, this is a side pocket nystagmus, but then the left beating decreases. It's just the downbeat, just the downbeat. And then it starts to reverse direction. So now it's beating centripetally. It's beating, it's a right beating nystagmus. It's beating back toward the center. This is an example of a patient with gaze evoked nystagmus and centripetal nystagmus and rebound nystagmus. And, and these three can be found on a spectrum 
Um, gaze evoke than rebound are really common. Centripetal nystagmus is far less common. I don't understand why that is. This patient actually has um, just uh, was found to have a sky high anti GAD level, anti glutamic um, acid decarboxylase level. So she's being worked up for possible stiff person syndrome. Um, so this seems like an autoimmune disorder rather than a cerebellar degeneration at this point. When you see gaze evoked, rebound, centripetal, think about a leaky neural integrator um, that's related to the cerebellum or its connections. Remember that the neural integrators um, are for horizontal gaze holding. We're talking about the nucleus propositus hypoglossi. We're talking about the medial vestibular nucleus and the medulla. Um, for vertical and torsional gaze holding, we're talking about the interstitial nucleus of Cajal, but the flocculus and paraflocculus help those structures to, to, or optimizes the performance of those structures. So if you have gaze evoked in all planes, um, vertically and horizontally, it's much more likely that that's a cerebellar problem, usually a, a flocculus, paraflocculus, or its connections um, to and from the, the brain stem. All right, so it's stroke nystagmus. When should I freak out? So. Don't freak out um, if, it, if it looks peripheral. If you see upbeat torsional positional nystagmus, that's almost always gonna be posterior canal BPPV. If you see geotropic positional nystagmus, that's almost always going to be horizontal canal BPPV with few exceptions. Sometimes th this can be central as well. Um, could be peripheral. So unidirectional vestibular nystagmus, like I said, this is what you should see with a vestibular neuritis, but you can still have unidirectional nystagmus that is central in origin, um, a central vestibular nystagmus. Um, apogeotropic positional nystagmus is usually horizontal canal BPPV, but, but don't forget about the possibility that that could be a central positional nystagmus. And what should be considered central until proven otherwise? Consider upbeat, consider downbeat, whether it's spontaneous or positional. Consider pure torsional nystagmus to be central until proven otherwise as well. PAN, um, consider that to be central until proven otherwise. There are um, rare exceptions, for instance, Meniere's disease. If you were to see a patient um, who's just transitioning from one phase of a Meniere's attack to the other, they may have first an excitatory pattern of nystagmus that transitions to an inhibitory pattern, um, that is that the, the direction reverses. All right, so what are some clinically important examples of jerk mimics, things that are not jerk nystagmus, but that kind of look like jerk nystagmus? So this is a, a, a big scary one. This is called opsoclonus. And you, this is, uh, the other name for this is saccadomania. You just see this back to back to back, saccade, saccade, saccade. There's no intersaccadic interval here. It's horizontal and vertical. The eyes are going in all directions. And it can be provoked by making a saccade. It can be provoked by eyelid closure. It can be provoked by having the patient converge, as we can see here. Um, but again, this is saccade, 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 no intersaccadic interval. The, the saccades are in all planes, horizontal and vertical. And this is, um, this is concerning if you see this. This is not jerk nystagmus. And this is the same kind of thing, but this is just seen horizontally. So if it's just seen horizontally, it's not opsoclonus, it's known as ocular flutter. You can also see some, some myoclonic jerks of the head and neck, which is typical of uh, kind of an opsoclonus myoclonus syndrome, or in this case, an ocular flutter myoclonus syndrome that um, happened to be post-infectious and she recovered and did very well. So again, flutter is horizontal only, opsoclonus or flutter. Um, in babies, always think about a neuroblastoma. In the young, think about a para or post-infectious. In older, think about something paraneoplastic related to lung cancer or a variety of other kinds of cancers have been associated with this. If you see flutter, if you see opsoclonus, basically it's, it means the same thing. You should be equally concerned if you see either of these the diagnostic implications are the same regardless of whether you see flutter or obstacles. Treat them the same. 
All right, so this is a monocular problem. This is a superior oblique myokinia. Again, pick your favorite conjunctival blood vessel, and you can see that it's moving. There's a rotation of the eye. And what's happening here is that there's an excitation of the superior oblique muscle. The primary action of the superior oblique muscle is in cycloduction, and that's what you're seeing. So it's excited, it moves this way, and then it relaxes, and then it's excited, and then it relaxes, and then it's excited, and then it relaxes. And here it is compared to the other eye. The, the left eye is not moving. This is only a monocular right eye problem. It's a superior oblique myokymia in the right eye only. This patient had monocular oscillopsia, monocular oscillopsia. So if he covered the right eye, he'd be fine. Covered the left eye, he would still experience the, the oscillopsia. And oftentimes, a, a binocular vertical diplopia, the reason is that the um, superior oblique muscle, the secondary action is depression. So if it's excited, it doesn't just in cycloduct, but it also comes down a little bit. It also depresses a little bit. And if it depresses enough um, that the two eyes are seeing two different visual targets that, that are separated, there's an ocular misalignment transiently that can not only cause monocular oscillopsia, but also binocular vertical diplopia. With both eyes open, um, there, there's a vertical displacement. There's a vertical ocular misalignment. This is not an isagmus or an intrusion, um, but rather, like I said, uh, the movement is due to superior oblique muscle excitation. And finally, a, a big one is, is square wave jerks. A lot of people call this, would call this nystagmus. It is not nystagmus. These are square wave jerks. This is a patient with progressive supranuclear palsy where they can be quite prominent, um, but also with Parkinson's disease. They can be pretty prominent as well as cerebellar disorders. And like I said, it's all about the company that it keeps. Um, so if you see other features of a cerebellar disorder, it's probably gonna be a, a cerebellar localization if there are a lot of square waves. If you see other features of Parkinsonism, rigidity, um, uh, tremor for instance, then probably it's gonna be related to Parkinsonism and not a cerebellar disorder. All right, it looks like jerk, but it's not. When should I freak out? So benign usually, superior oblique myokinia. Um, typically that's, uh, these, these patients, nothing bad's going to happen to them. Typically it's, it's thought, although we don't, we don't fully understand um, all of the cases and why exactly this is happening. Um, but in a lot of cases, we think that probably there's some neurovascular compression of the fourth cranial nerve um, that's causing an intermittent excitation, much like a patient with a trigeminal neuralgia oftentimes has neurovascular compression of the trigeminal nerve, and that causes the, the sharp sort of lancinating pain on one side of the face. Likewise, if there's neurovascular compression of the fourth cranial nerve, the superior oblique muscle can periodically be excited and, and can result in the superior oblique myokinia. Square wave jerks, again, typically are, are benign when they're seen in isolation, but um, you got to look at the other eye movements. You, you got to think about, um, or somebody needs to perform a neurologic exam on them as well. Dangerous potentially is, is everything else that I showed you, right? The, the flutter of the um, opsoclonus, um, be concerned about everything else. All right, pendular nystagmus. What are some clinically important examples? This is the patient I showed before with oculopaudal tremor. And here you can see it's, it's almost pure vertical, up and down and up and down, pretty large amplitude. It's relatively slow. This patient was really debilitated by all the oscillopsis she was experiencing. You can see a little bit of a torsional pendular phase as well at times, but the bulk of the movement is vertical. Um, this patient had a, a hemorrhagic pontine cavernoma. That's typically what happens, um, and it affects the central tegmental tract. And um, months or sometimes years later after the insult, this is what you may see. If you look at the MRI, you'll commonly see um, a hyperintensity of the inferior olives in the medulla. Um, this is an example of hypertrophic olivary degeneration. And I realize that you can't see the palate here. I'll show you on the next slide. Um, basically, pontine hemorrhage causing central tegmental tract damage is common. On the MRI, you're going to see this hypertrophy. Look for it. Gabapentin and mamantine can be 
medications that, that, that are in some cases helpful, not, not for everybody, unfortunately. Again, this is an example of a pendular nystagmus, slow phase, slow phase, slow phase. And so here's the palatal tremor. And again, you, you have to look at the palate. You, you can't just say, say, ah, because you'll miss it. But you really have to know what you're looking for, have the patient open their mouth. And you may see this pendular nystagmus. So any funny pendular nystagmus, I'm sorry, any funny pendular nystagmus you see, look for this palatal tremor. You can have one without the other. You can have a patient whose balance is off um, who has a palatal tremor without the nystagmus. You can have a patient who has pendular nystagmus without the palatal tremor. Um, in both cases, typically you're going to see this inferior olivary hypertrophy, though. So um, it's typically, or it's thought to be due to a lesion in um, so-called Muller Ray's triangle, um, which is this imaginary triangle that's connecting the inferior olive to the dentate to the red nucleus. Um, but commonly in the pons, there's a, there's a hemorrhage, there's a cavernoma that's bled. It damages this descending central tegmental tract and it causes a disinhibition of the inferior olive and the inferior olive just kind of fires at will um, and becomes too overactive. And, and that creates the, the sort of the pathogenesis of this oculopalatal tremor. So here is a patient with multiple sclerosis, um, pendular nystagmus. This is pretty subtle, but this patient was experiencing pretty significant oscillopsia. And with MS, typically horizontal or elliptical is most common. And again, if you, you don't have to remember what medications help what kind of pendular nystagmus because it's basically the same as it was for oculopalatal tremor. We're still talking about gabapentin or uh, mimantine here. Some other features um, of uh, pendular nystagmus, here it's an elliptical, is that it can be suppressed by saccades. So the patient makes a saccade and it stops for a, a second and then it, it ramps up again, stops with each saccade. Also it blinks, so he blinks his eyes and it kind of stops. So if somebody really needs to focus, a patient who has um, pendular and eye segments like this, and they really need to focus, you can tell them that they may be able to focus a little bit better transiently by making a saccade from one object to another, or just simply by blinking the eyes. It can kind of reset um, th this, um, this aberrant circuitry and sometimes uh, give the patient a second or two of, of clearer vision. So the um, acquired pendulum nystagmus suppresses briefly with blinks and saccades, and whether this represents sort of a reset of the neurointegrator um, is unclear, but that's probably what is happening. So this patient has a lot of nystagmus in the left eye and nothing in the right eye. And this patient in the left eye um, has a more, much more severe optic neuropathy. She's hand motions only in the left eye. Um, her vision is not normal in the right eye. She also has a right optic neuropathy, but it is worse in the left eye. And likewise, there's a lot more nystagmus in the left eye. So this is a common situation um, in MS where sometimes it's completely monocular. It's just in one eye, or sometimes it's really disconjugate um, and it's, it, it can be a lot worse in the worst seeing eye, more nystagmus in the worst seeing eye. Usually more intense in the worst seeing eye, as I mentioned. All right, so it's pendular, should I freak out? Yes, you should freak out. Um, but here's a little summary. So oculopatal tremor, typically it's vertical or torsional or vertical and torsional. It's commonly disjunctive, meaning that the two eyes can be doing different things. One eye can be sort of more vertical, the other can be more torsional. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. The frequency is a little bit less. It's a slower movement. And uh, gabapentin, memantine, sometimes clonazepam can be helpful for that. Acquire pendular nystagmus due to MS. The appearance is typically horizontal, elliptical, um, commonly disconjugate, um, and it can be more intense in the worst seeing eye. Sometimes it's completely monocular 
with a frequency that is that is higher than that of the oculopatal charmer. It's a faster movement, um, but the medications are the same. So don't forget to look at the palate. Look for this palatal tremor in any patient who has a funny pendular nystagmus, who doesn't clearly have multiple sclerosis. All right, so some benign clinically important examples. This is latent nystagmus. So the patient is looking with his right eye, and there's right beating nystagmus. No nystagmus, both eyes open. Now he's looking with the left eye, and there's left beating nystagmus. So this is an example of latent nystagmus. It changes direction depending on the eye viewing. It's usually associated with infantile esotropia, crossing of the eyes, and a lazy eye or amblyopia. Basically, there is some abnormal development of binocular vision in infancy, um, and that can create latent nystagmus. For patient or for, for providers who see dizzy patients, um, this can be really confusing because this is not vestibular, but depending on which eye the patient chooses to or is viewing with, um, it can really impact your vestibular exam. So be aware of that. Look for latent nystagmus because it can really impact your vestibular testing or your vestibular exam. Benign congenital or infantile nystagmus can have jerk and pendular components. So it was left beating to the left, it was right beating up and down in vertical gaze. And now it's pendular. So this is the same patient, it's jerk at times, it's pendular at times. And uh, it was known that she had had um, nystagmus for her entire lifetime, so it wasn't much of a diagnostic conundrum. But when you see both jerk and pendular components, um, think about infantile nystagmus. Um, with infantile nystagmus, also it's, it's going to damp with convergence. So if you have the patient look at a near target, um, converge the eyes, typically it's gonna decrease in intensity. Or this is a patient with, with Usher syndrome. He has a um, retinitis pigmentosa, and he's got a pendular nystagmus as well. But in this case, it wasn't due to a brain problem. It was due to his retinal disease and his vision loss. And whether this is a consequence of a loss of calibration of the neural integrator, that's one theory for nystagmus due to visual deprivation. Um, but this is sort of benign in the sense that this is not related to a neurologic disorder per se. Um, the, the patient's brain can be very healthy and, and you can have um, nystagmus due to a retinal disorder, for instance, due to any, any vision problem. All right, so benign, um, asymptomatic, so physiologic endpoint nystagmus, we talked about that, square wave jerks that are in complete isolation in an elderly patient, chronic and associated with vision loss um, that you know about, like a retinopathy, like that patient with retinitis pigmentosa who had Usher syndrome in the last slide. Um, or if the patient's having uh, vestibular symptoms, dizziness, vertigo, or oscillopsia, um, and it's positional, BPPV, that's benign, vestibular neuritis, that's benign, and basically everything else is potentially dangerous that we talked about here today. So these patients do almost always need some neurologic workup, whether that's just simply an MRI of the brain or whether um, a lot more is needed. All right. And for no other reason um, other than to keep you on your toes, here's a cat with nystagmus. In this case, it is right beating nystagmus. This patient did have the acute vestibular syndrome. Unfortunately, um, a HINTS exam was not performed. And also, unfortunately, the cat did not have a good outcome and uh, passed away shortly after this video was made. So presumably, there was a central cause of the acute vestibular syndrome, um, unfortunately. So sorry, sorry to be a downer. And I will stop this part of the talk and um, pick up in just a moment. José Luis, eh, continuamos entonces con la segunda parte.
All right, I'm ready to become a nystagmologist. Tell me more. Here you go. So the acute vestibular syndrome in hints, um, using that as an example, um, we can tell a lot from just the spontaneous nystagmus, right? So if it's pure torsion or pure vertical, that's concerning for central. If it's mixed horizontal torsional, as we see here, that's commonly seen with vestibular neuritis and other peripheral vestibular nystagmus um, disorders. And in this case, in fact, it was due to an acute right-sided uh, vestibular loss and acute right vestibular neuritis. And, and clearly you can see the left beating torsional nystagmus. Um, this was a case of peripheral vestibular neuritis, although just seeing this by itself doesn't necessarily mean that it is peripheral. It still could be central. That's why HINTS is a three-step test, not a one-step test. Over here, we can see an upbeat torsional nystagmus. If you saw this, um, that was, and it was provoked by the dix Holtpike maneuver, you might think that's a posterior canal BPPV. But in fact, this was a patient who was also presenting to the emergency department with acute vestibular syndrome and this patient had a stroke. So when you see spontaneous vertical or spontaneous torsional or spontaneous vertical and torsional nystagmus, um, that, should be, that, that should be a big clue that this is a central etiology um, and, and this patient had an abnormal HINTS exam or a central HINTS exam and had a, a stroke involving the medial longitudinal fasciculus in the brainstem. So again, with the HINTS exam, um, we wanna know if it's unidirectional or if it's gaze evoked. I put unidirectional in yellow because as we discussed, just the fact that it's unidirectional doesn't distinguish between peripheral or central, but this patient has a left beating nystagmus that increases in left gaze. It is unidirectional. This patient does not. This patient has a, a right beating and right gaze, left beating and left gaze. This is a bidirectional gaze evoked so unidirectional could be peripheral, usually it is, but it doesn't have to be. And if you see something like this, the gaze evoked, that is central until proven otherwise. So don't just look at the spontaneous nystagmus, but you wanna see what happens to it in each uh, direction of gaze, up, down, left, right. And here you can even see that it is gaze evoked vertically. There's up beating and up gaze, and there's even down beating and down gaze. So take a look at it in each direction of gaze. You want to know if the eyes are moving in different directions. This patient actually has something called hemi-seesaw, where the, the torsional component is conjugate and um, the fast faces, the top poles are beating towards the right ear. But clearly, if you look, kind of defocus and look here, it's a little bit easier to appreciate. The right eye is coming down. There's a downbeat component, component to it, whereas the left eye, it, um, there's an upbeat component to it. So the eyes are going in different directions. Um, if you see pendular seesaw nystagmus, where one eye is going up um, and sort of, and the other eye is, um, is going down simultaneously, um, and the, the torsional components are in different directions, that is a pendular seesaw nystagmus, or rather, um, the, the pendular torsional component is going to be conjugate as well. If it's pendular seesaw, Think about something in the chiasm. Think about somebody with a, a cellar lesion, oftentimes associated with a bitemporal hemianopia. In this case, the, this was a hemi or jerky seesaw nystagmus. Think about the brainstem. Oftentimes, there's an associated ocular tilt reaction as well, which is not um, hard to believe because if you think about maybe the, the slow phase is sort of resultant from the ocular tilt reaction where one eye is going up, one eye is going down. Maybe that's creating the slow phase, and then there's a fast phase in the opposite direction. Assess for changes with vergence as well. This patient has up beating at near, and then I have him look at distance, and now it's down beating. And now he's looking at near, and it's up beating. So it changes vertical direction. What does this mean? So in this case, it's upbeat at near, it's downbeat at distance. Maybe this has to do with the, the cerebellum sensing incorrectly that the head is translating. Um, the, the translational VOR has a lot to do with the orbital position. Um, and so convergence can change, can provoke um, or 
accentuate um, different kinds of vertical nystagmus. So it's always worth checking what effect distance and virgins has on the nystagmus and if you can provoke it. Um, for instance, a patient has some imbalance, they have a little bit of gaze evoked in right or left gaze. They don't have spontaneous downbeat, but if you have them look at their own thumb at near, um, oftentimes you will see that that convergence will provoke some downbeat nystagmus. This is a patient with infantile nystagmus who has a little bit of right beating, but different head positions um, make it worse and make it better. Oh, feeling um, shake, yes. I can kind of see it. And she's experiencing a little bit of oscillopsy here with a head tilt to the left where clearly the right beating nystagmus has increased. Um, so patients with an infantile nystagmus oftentimes will have kind of a null position where a, a specific head turn, a head tilt will abate the nystagmus, will mitigate the nystagmus. Um, and so there are certain positions where alternatively you can make it worse so you can bring it out more. So always ask the patient if, if something makes it better or something makes it worse. And um, if they feel worse in one position, then always take a look and, and see what happens to the nystagmus when they assume that head position. Um, also patients with, with a, um, a vestibular neuritis typically like to, um, to, to lie down with the, the healthy ear down. Um, when the lesioned ear is down, typically their, their nystagmus will be even worse. So be aware of that. Is the vector the same in both eyes? So clearly here, there's more of a vertical component in the left eye. There's a little bit more of a horizontal Close and a diagonal eye. component in the right eye. He's got a Bell's palsy, a facial nerve palsy. You can see the Bell's phenomenon here as well. Open your and this eye. is a patient with oculopalatal tremor with a disjunctive nystagmus because the two eyes are, are heading in different directions. And that is a common feature of um, oculopalatal tremor as well. Again, there's pendular nystagmus here in the, in the left eye, but really not anything that you can see in the right eye. This is a patient with um, acquired pendular nystagmus due to multiple sclerosis. And there's a significant difference in size. Um, when you look at the right eye at the optic nerve with the ophthalmoscope, it was apparent that there was a little bit of jiggling, um, a little bit of pendular nystagmus, very subtle, but not, not nearly as much as there was in the left eye. This is an example of dissociated, or sometimes referred to as disconjugate nystagmus, which can be typical of, of pendular nystagmus related to multiple sclerosis. Again, um, it can be stronger, more intense in one eye, or sometimes it can just be frankly monocular, just seen in one eye. Um, so that this is something to look for. And as I mentioned before, it's typically the eye that's moving the most is typically the worst seeing eye as well. Look Are the, the movements synchronous? So this patient has Look to the right. a left again. intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. You can see this the lag left. of the eye. Also has right. a right eye and O, but much more on the Look left. To the left. See a little abducting nystagmus, right. abducting nystagmus. You can left to right. Abducting nystagmus. The left as far as you can. Look to the right as far as you can. Abducting nystagmus. Look to the left. Again, there's an asynchrony here. There's Look to the right. nystagmus in the right eye and the abducting eye, but not in the adducting eye. Um, this is typical of intranuclear ophthalmoplegia, INO, due to a medial longitudinal fasciculus lesion. The ophthalmoscope can be your friend as well. This was picked up with uh, video oculography, but really subtle. This is a patient who had MS and had experienced transient oscillopsia um, for about a year, and I was never able to see it, and she sent me some home videos, and I was never able to see it. And then finally, one year later, I always suspected it was pendular nystagmus related to MS. But one year later, it, it became much more constant throughout the day. It wasn't just a couple minutes or a couple seconds here and there. It was pretty constant. You can see this very subtle back and forth jiggling movement. And this is really subtle, and this could easily be overlooked um, by the, the astute clinician who isn't really looking to see if there's some jiggling and jumping. But with the magnification of the ophthalmoscope, looking at the back of the eye, looking at the optic nerve, this was so much more prominent and so much more apparent. 
Um, so the ophthalmoscope can be your friend. Patients can have really subtle nystagmus or movements or micro nystagmus or micro flutter. Um, so the ophthalmoscope can be really helpful. It can detect subtle movements. It can also help determine the trajectory. In a patient like this, this patient has both upbeat nystagmus but also ocular flutter. There's a lot going on and it's really hard to see what's happening. Um, but it can be a lot easier if you look um, with the ophthalmoscope, with the magnification of that, the ophthalmoscope, it was apparent that the eye was always moving down and coming back up. There was an upbeat nystagmus and then periodically there was a, a little ocular flutter back and forth too. Um, so this was helpful to really understand the trajectory and understand and dissect these eye movements to try to figure out what was contributing. Good, look at the light. This is a patient um, with a, a right-sided vestibular neuritis and he has a spontaneous left beating nystagmus and it wasn't so apparent, it was there, but it was much more apparent with removal of fixation. This was with a pen light cover test the left eye was covered and, and the, the bright light of my phone camera um, was sort of blinding his right eye, partially removing fixation. So I was able to, to increase the nystagmus by suppressing his ability to fixate. So this was an example of a pen light cover test. Um, but you want to know what effect, um, if any, does, um, does fixation, removal of fixation have on nystagmus? And if you remove fixation, and the patient has vestibular nystagmus, characteristically it will um, increase in intensity, especially peripheral vestibular nystagmus. So what are some other ways to remove fixation? So Frenzel goggles are great. Video Frenzels are even better because you've got these infrared goggles and you're really sort of completely removing fixation here. Pen light cover test, essentially what I just did, I was occluding the left eye and kind of blinding the right eye with the, the bright light, um, partially removing fixation, or you can completely remove fixation by having the patient cover one eye and then look at the other eye, um, the fellow eye with the ophthalmoscope. In this case, you have the magnification of the ophthalmoscope as well. All right, does it matter which eye is fixating? I showed this example before of latent nystagmus. The right eye is viewing and there's right beating. Now the left eye is viewing and there's left beating. So um, latent nystagmus is, is very characteristic and you will capture this, you will see this by covering each eye individually to see what happens to the nystagmus. Right eyes viewing, right beating. Left eyes viewing, left beating. A complete ocular motor and vestibular exam is really essential. Okay, so in this situation, he's got normal horizontal saccades but he can't make vertical saccades. He's got absent, completely absent downward saccades. He's got very slow upward saccades, but all the other classes of eye movements are working well. Just gonna zoom through. His oblique saccades are just horizontal because there's no, um, the, he cannot generate vertical saccades. But the VOR is normal. So there's a normal range of movements. The VOR is normal. And vertical pursuit, likewise, is normal. Here he's just following his own thumb up and following it down. Okay, so unless you check all classes of eye movements um, horizontally and vertically, you would have completely overlooked the fact that all he has is a vertical saccade palsy, which in his case was due to a rostral interstitial medial longitudinal fasciculus lesion. The vertical burst neurons in the midbrain were not working. So this really has localizing value. If you have an RIMLF lesion acutely, unilateral lesion, that can also cause a torsional nystagmus. So if you just saw the torsional nystagmus and you didn't check saccades horizontally and vertically in different classes of eye movements, you would never have been able to come to that conclusion to, to accurately localize as you could in this case. So a complete ocular motor and vestibular exam is really essential. Looking at all the different classes of eye movements, that tells you where it is um, a, a much of the time, not, not every time, but, but many times it'll tell you 
where the problem is, and then you can try to figure out the etiology based on that. Okay, so evaluate everything. See how these different um, classes affect the nystagmus as well, especially we talked about virgins, we talked about saccades um, being sort of a, a trigger for some, like opsoclonus or flutter, um, or the, the um, nystagmus, pendular nystagmus would even abate um, briefly after making a saccade. So evaluate everything. All right, so summary for the future nystagmologist. So look at the nystagmus in primary and other directions of gaze, as in the Hintz exam. Are the eyes moving in the same vertical direction? Think about a seesaw nystagmus or a hemi or a jerk, jerky seesaw nystagmus like I showed in the example. Um, is there a change with vergence? So is nystagmus provoked or increased by convergence, for instance, in a patient with cerebellar ataxia? Convergence, like I said, will oftentimes either increase downbeat if there already is downbeat um, or provoke downbeat if there wasn't any spontaneous nystagmus to begin with. What's the influence of head tilt or turn? So infantile nystagmus, I showed you that. There can be a null position where the nystagmus is, is the least intense, um, but you can also find some, some head postures that make it much more intense and sometimes even symptomatic and um, the patient can experience oscillopsia. PAN, for periodic alternating nystagmus, patients may learn that a certain head position can, can abate um, the nystagmus um, pre, uh, transiently. Again, in, in accordance with Alexander's law, if the nystagmus is beating to the right, if the patient looks to the right, um, it's going to increase that right beating nystagmus. So they may turn their head to the right so that they're looking to the left when the nystagmus is right beating, and they may turn their head to the right um, when it's left beating. So pay attention to the head position. Is the nystagmus disjunctive? I showed you the patient with oculopatal tremor where one eye is a little bit more vertical, the other eye is a little bit more sort of horizontal diagonal. Um, and so those patients can be really symptomatic. Is the nystagmus disconjugate? Likewise, if the two eyes are sort of moving at different speeds, different intensities, um, as typically happens in MS, usually in the worst seeing eye, the eye is jiggling more. Um, that can be really debilitating. Is the nystagmus asynchronous between the two eyes? So abducting nystagmus and an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. The ophthalmoscope can be really helpful looking for, for subtle um, findings, micronystagmus or intrusions, but also can help determine the trajectory in really complicated cases. And you want to know what happens when you remove fixation, um, especially when you're trying to distinguish a peripheral versus a central vestibular nystagmus. Um, does the nystagmus change depending on the viewing eye? For this specifically, you're thinking about latent nystagmus, which um, is a benign disorder. It doesn't mean anything. It's not the cause of your patient's dizziness, for instance. Um, but knowing that they have latent nystagmus will really help you to interpret their vestibular testing, their vestibular bedside exam. And you got to evaluate all classes of eye movements horizontally and vertically. This can really help you to localize that nystagmus. What's going on? Is this a cerebellar problem? Is this a brainstem problem? Um, and, and then you can try to figure out what's going on based on that. Take home points. Not all abnormal movements are nystagmus. Interpret wiggles and jiggles in the context of associated symptoms and signs and chronicity. Recognition of the nystagmus type can help you to localize. There are therapeutic options for these patients if you correctly identify the wiggle or the jiggle, so please try your best to do so. Thank you for your time and attention, and as always, if you wanna see these videos and much more, um, feel free to check out my collection through the North American Neuro Ophthalmology Society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold. Um, we are, that, that lecture was very, very illustrative. Um, I love the videos and, and two things are clear. I do want the book and the second is I do want to become an nystagmologist. I truly want to. I think most of the people here in the audience also want to become a nystagmologist. I think we, we, we can uh, say we can partly are nystagmologists due to all these lectures that we have learned so much. Um, I don't know if Dr. Pinto, uh, am, I, am I allowed to uh, 
to present um, one one case. I wanted to talk to you, Dr. Gold, that sometimes the cases um, are not so um, definite. I mean, they don't have so many features when you are exploring them. So I want to show you my graduation case from these lectures. If I'm allowed, uh, it's, it's very simple. It's a uh, um, um, let me let me let me share. This is a woman. Um, let me let me sh show you. It, she is like uh, 37 years old. Um, she came to my clinic because she had she had a lot of ataxia, and she couldn't um, walk. She couldn't eat. She she had hiccups. Uh, as we have mentioned before, we have many cases with hiccups, and but most importantly, she had she had ataxia. So I did this exploration with friends' little uh, glasses, um, and she seemed, she doesn't look so well. But the beginning, it kind of look it's it's like it's kind of blurry, but there is um, an upward gaze nystagmus. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, but it comes and goes. It's very, it's very hard this case because I was. Um, she already had a previous evaluation by a neurologist, and the neurologist just gave her antidepressants. Um, so I was like, "What about this gaze, uh, nystagmus, upward gaze?" But it was more like in your in your lecture, it was more like a, like a pendular nystagmus. It seemed, but it came and goes. So um, I saw her again and I did this uh, Romber test because the ataxia. And you can see here that she is, in the, at that moment, she was pretty okay. She closed her eyes and there was no movement, there was no falls. So I was I was puzzled, you know, I was puzzled of this case because she she mentioned she has so much ataxia. So I saw her again. I did the exam, ocular exam test again. I don't know if you can give me any feedback, Dr. Gold, but she she did the and she had no no pendular, no nystagmus, no nothing. So mm -hmm. I was I was puzzled. So I finally did the MRI because of the hiccups and the ataxia, and she had this least lesion. I was amazed. I was amazed because the only thing that I truly um, prescribed the MRI is because we have mentioned here in the classes before that uh, extreme ataxia or extreme incapacity to maintain the seating um, position could be a central cause. So you can see here another image. So it was pretty huge. So the, it, probably the only thing that I, I did this MRI is because this upward gaze nystagmus or, or pendular movement that came and go. I don't know if you, you could see anything because it's very hard for us that sometimes patients will come to your clinic and they don't have like distinct features. So you can have a lot of things to to make the diagnosis. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, with, with the Frenzels on, it looks like maybe there was a little bit of, of gaze evokes, up yes. beating and, and mm -hmm. up gaze. It also mm -hmm. looked like maybe there was a little bit of right beating and right gaze and left beating and left gaze. Mm -hmm. um, so that that gaze evokes um, yes. when it's when it's not when it's horizontal and vertical. Mm -hmm. That that makes you think about the cerebellum or its connections to mm -hmm. and from the brainstem, the flocculus, paraflocculus, all those structures. Um, I, I wonder if, but then you showed the, her looking right, left, up and down without the Frenzels and it yes. wasn't so clear. Um, mm -hmm. One time she moved from lateral gaze to the, from the right to the center. And I wonder mm -hmm. if she actually overshot. I wonder if there was some psychotic okay. dysmetria. So that, that might have been another clue if there was a psychotic pursuit or yes. psychotic dysmetria. Mm -hmm. But I would say any young person who has mm -hmm. really significant unexplained um, imbalance, you had mentioned mm -hmm. ataxia several times, um, that's concerning. I would definitely get an MRI on all yes. of those patients. 
definitely if there's hiccups as well, unexplained mm -hmm. hiccups, like you said, that, that can mm -hmm. indicate a brainstem problem. Um, so I think that you did the right things. You were concerned. You didn't have a, a clear explanation from an ear standpoint. Mm -hmm. And so you got an MRI, which is what the neurologist should have done. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, um, that, that was my graduation case. Um, I think she had a CT scan like one year and a half ago and it was normal. So they kind of yeah. like just, yeah, you know, because of the of the background of the previous CT scan, they didn't order new MRIs or. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say from a, a, a posterior fossa, when you're talking about the cerebellum, you're talking about the mm -hmm. brainstem, CAT scan isn't isn't a good test. Um, in retrospect, probably if they look back, there was something on the CAT scan now mm -hmm. that, that they know that there's a big tumor. Um, but also be aware of the fact that sometimes you can miss little things like mm -hmm. a, a small lesion of the nodulus in somebody who has a persistent uh, positional vertigo if you don't mm -hmm. give gadolinium, if you don't give contrast. Mm -hmm. So um, a CAT scan is usually not adequate. You're, you're almost always going to need an MRI to evaluate the brain stem of the cerebellum, but sometimes not even an MRI is, is adequate. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need to get a second MRI with contrast. Um, usually you'll see it right. with an MRI, but there are lots of case reports out there of little nodulous lesions that cause a central positional vertigo and nystagmus. And finally, somebody did an MRI with, with gadolinium and, and they, they saw it. So uh, another caveat. But um, yeah, okay. no, you, re you recognized all of the, the red flags there. And so I think that's great. So you, you, passed, you. Your, you passed your final exam, A+. <laughs> Thank you. But about Dr. Toledo, if you want, um, you want to have any comment or question? Thank you, Dr. Gold. Yes, well, first of all, I want to say thank you. It was a wonderful, wonderful every case and all the videos. Thank you so much for sharing all these patients. I want to ask you in, in case of superior BPPB and canal, and could you know which size is affected when you have a downbeat nystagmus? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so anterior canal BPPV is, is tough. Um, and so if there's, if there's clearly a downbeat and torsional component, then you, you, it, usually it's, it's gonna beat, the torsion is gonna beat, the top holes of the torsion is going to be toward the affected ear. Um, but then the question is, is it actually anterior canal BPPV or could this be an apogeotropic posterior canal? Um, mm -hmm. Is this in the short arm? Um, so it's, it's, it's challenging. I mean, I, I can count on maybe with two fingers the, the number of times that I've been convinced that somebody has um, a, a true anterior canal BPPV rather than just a posterior canal variant that's behaving a little strangely, a short arm variant. Um, so, but if the torsion is present, then sometimes that, that, that can indicate the side, the torsion, the top pole should be beating toward the affected ear if it is in fact anterior canal BPPV. And if anybody else has anything to, to add to that, please do. Mm -hmm. If anybody sees a lot of anterior canal BPPV. No. <laughs> yeah. Not really. Right. Um, doctor, uh, is someone, is the, the, the mic is open for anyone to share. Is anyone wants to make a live question? It's open. I can open your microphone, so you just open and raise your hand. Okay, um, I'm also concerned um, about the positional nystagmus, Dr. Gold, about um, sometimes I do have patients with um, probably vestibular neuritis, or I, I recently have a southern cerebral hearing loss, a patient with southern cerebral hearing loss, a little bit of vertigo, and she had no longer vertigo when she came into my clinic. And I, I, I always do the, the help test to all patients. And in this patient, she had like one previous week, the, the sudden uh, hearing loss. And she had at the positional uh, test, the help test, she had like horizontal and the stack was very, very, very strong. So I do, um, you, I don't know, you can tell us more about the positional nystagmus or what happens when you have another vestibular uh, lesion 
because I do, uh, you know, when you have Meniere disease, you can also have, uh, you know, uh, benign positional vertigo. So I always do the DISHAPA test. But when you have another lesions, um, in this particular case with the southern cesarean neural hearing loss, this, this patient developed a really horizontal nystagmus of this Halbach test. Is this mm -hmm. common or, or what would you expect in those cases? Right. And so was that geotropic or apogeotropic? It was geotropic. Geotropic. And I did, it, did, it, geotropic. did it resolve with... Uh, yeah, it resolved completely. I saw her. Yeah, I, I resolved. It yeah. resolved completely. Um, uh, after I, I, what I did with her is I did uh, I gave prednisone and and I gave her uh, dexamethasone injections, intratympanic injections, and afterwards it resolved completely. I think it was it. because it was very um, probably inflammated. I mean, with inflammation the inner ear probably. I don't know. What yeah, it's tough. I mean, if. Right. It, it, so if somebody has, so certainly if you have uh, sensory neural hearing loss, sudden sensory neural hearing loss plus vertigo, always at least consider the possibility of a labyrinthine stroke um, okay. first, just from okay. a kind of a, a dangerous vascular standpoint. Um, but a lot of patients, 10 to 20% of patients with vestibular neuritis develop BPPV um, as well in the, in the subsequent weeks or months. And we don't fully understand why that is, right? If this is, yes. if it's an ear problem, which vestibular neuritis isn't, it's affecting the nerve. But mm -hmm. if you affect, have some destructive lesion of the labyrinth, then that might make you more susceptible to sort of releasing mode aconia and getting BPPB. Yes. Um, the other thing that I mentioned is that patients with vestibular neuritis really prefer to keep the, the, the intact ear down. So if there's a, a right vestibular neuritis, that patient oftentimes will lie there with the left ear down. Um, and so is that a reason for, for, for why BPPV is so common yes. um, in after vestibular neuritis? Maybe it has nothing to do with the lesion itself. Maybe it has more to do with the position that the patient now likes to be in, now likes to assume. Okay. So I, I don't know, um, but it, it, if, if anybody else would like to chime in, feel free, but the exact mechanism, the pathophysiology, is it sort of due to direct injury? Um, certainly if there was a labyrinthine um, insult that caused the hearing loss and the vestibulopathy, which makes the most sense, and then subsequently there was some otoconia that sloughed off of the mm -hmm. utricle and wound up in the horizontal canal, that certainly mm -hmm. makes sense, but um, yeah, just trying to put everything into the clinical context and, and understand if the patient's having positional vertigo as well. And um, as everyone knows, it, it, patients are allowed to have uh, two, more than one vestibular disorder at, at, at a mm -hmm. time. Yes, it can happen. What about the central positional nystagmus? Is that common in your clinic? I mean, the central positional nystagmus, do you see that often in what cases? Right, yeah, so it's, it's I mean, it's still pretty uncommon, but um, by far the sort of the, the biggest patient population who we see that in, who I see that in, are patients with mm -hmm. vestibular migraine, um, especially okay. during migraine, but maybe even between migraines. They can have a lot of funny um, little wiggles and jiggles um, with uh, fixation removed and, and Dixal bike and supine roll. So I guess I would say if it's geotropic, um, and also if somebody has sort of a sun, sudden sensory neural hearing loss and vertigo, could that be a labyrinthine stroke theoretically? And because that's the anterior inferior cerebellar artery territory, mm -hmm. could there be a simultaneous cerebellar stroke? And could that okay. cerebellar stroke be what's responsible for the, the central positional vertigo? Um, affecting areas of the vestibulocerebellum, like the flocculus or the paraflocculus, or like the nodulus or the uvula, for instance. Um, so that's another potential way to put, put that kind of a case together if somebody has an acute vestibular syndrome and central positional vertigo or an isagmus. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I have a very good relationship with vestibular physical therapists, and, um, and my wife is actually a vestibular physical therapist. So wow. if if something looks suspicious um, or doesn't follow the rules, then I either always image them or always follow up with them closely or always have them see a therapist who I trust. And if they can't resolve that, that positional um, nystagmus or positional vertigo, 
then I, I get MRIs on all of those patients because you don't, you don't want to miss it. Excellent. Uh, we have three, uh, three people that want to participate today. Dr. Justiniano, this is your graduation day also. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think, I think you're, already, you're already a nice stagmologist. You've been one for longer than I have, I think. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Hello, Dr. Daniel Gold. Great presentation. Well, Thank you. My question is about, in, in this opportunity, is about season and stagmol. But the true season is stable, not M season is stable, no? Pendular season is stable. In my experience, for example, I, I, I have seen some cases of season is of Morsier syndrome, for example, with hypoplasia optic nerve or achiasm, mm -hmm. maybe. And other cases I've seen, for example, in, in some traumatic encephalopathy, traumatic. And, and in some congenital, but I, have, I haven't seen any cases of hypophysis tumor. My question is, have you seen any case with hypophysis tumor with cis of nystagmus? Mm -hmm. With, with infant, infantile or congenital nystagmus? No. No. Tumor. Cis of nystagmus. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Seesaw and Um yeah. So I personally, so I guess I, I have seen one patient and there are a lot of papers out there. Why, if, if macroadenomas and, and pituitary and cellular lesions are, they're not common, but they're relatively common. There are a lot of patients out there who have complete bitemporal hemianopias mm -hmm. um, from a big pituitary tumor why don't more people have pendular seesaw nystagmus? Why is it so rare? Um, mm -hmm. I have seen one single patient with it um, who had, I think, a, uh, a pilocytic astrocytoma involving the chiasm. Mm -hmm. And um, there are different theories for why that is. Um, and and I, don't, I don't fully understand any of them. In my opinion, they don't fully explain um, why exactly that is. So, but it, it's thought that maybe you have to have some involvement of the interstitial nucleus of Cajal in addition to having a, a complete bitemporal hemianopia, but some patients don't have a complete bitemporal hemianopia. Um, some patient, patients have sparing of the interstitial nucleus of Cajal. So it's rare, I agree with you. Um, it's very rare. Why exactly do some patients manifest with pendular seesaw who have a big pituitary macroadenoma um, while others don't? I don't have a good explanation for that. Well, in my cases, where were Morsier syndrome and optic atrophy or other etiology, but any cases of macroadenoma, for example. Can mm -hmm. I have a second question, is Erica? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. It's about is opsoclonus, opsoclonus. What is the etiopathogenia, etiopathogenia about opsoclonus? Is omnipause neurons, pasticia neurons, neurons, pasticia nucleus? What is the pathophotogenic for, for, for you? Right. So um, exactly what you just mentioned, those are the different theories. And again, we, we don't know with 100% certainty whether it's uh, a, a selective involvement of the omnipause cells that just cause uh, a lack of inhibition of the, the, the burst neurons, and then there's just saccade, 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 saccade. Whether this is coming from mainly from the vestigial nucleus, areas of the cerebellum that are responsible for, um, for saccades. So probably there is some degree of each of those um, in a lot of patients, some combination, um, but Last I checked, unless a paper just came out in the last couple months that says this is definitely the mechanism, it's kind of all, all of the above, depending on, on the particular patient. Well, and in your case, doctor, you show us the before some one case with Adbit nystagmus and Opsoclonus. You show us what is the cause in that patient? What so was she, the cause? Right, so she had a medullary, or it was a, a cerebellar 
uh, pilocytic astrocytoma. She had surgery. She had radiation. She had chemotherapy. Oh, yeah. Right. So she had she had many reasons to have the upbeat. There was involvement of the medulla. And um, the ocular flutter was just, it was thought to be sort of due to her, her unwell cerebellum, the fact that her cerebellum had undergone <laughs> surgery and radiation. So in that case, it was thought that her ocular flutter was not an omnipause uh, problem primarily, but rather it was probably coming from the vestigial nucleus or some disinhibition, for instance, um, in the cerebellum. Okay, thank you so much. Yep. Uh, Dr. Claudia Silva, she's next, please. You can open your microphone. Oh, you, you can. I want to send you an invitation. There you go. No, no. there's an, no uh, mute. It's a new Too one, close. new invitation. Again. Claudia uh, Silva, there I you see. go. I see. I see. Yes. Uh, see. Yeah. Hi, first of all, thank you very much for your lecture, Daniel. Very, very nice. How can you make such a hard um, topic to be interesting and fun and enjoyable? Uh, really, congratulations and looking forward to, to get to the book and to read it. Um, thank you. Thank, uh, second, there, from the most common things that we see every day, I want to ask you, what, what is the most, I, I, I don't think that you just said it, but what is the most frequent nystagmus, positional nystagmus that you see in your uh, vestibular migraine patients? Uh, is, it, is it horizontal? Is it vertical? What, what, what do you see the most? Right. Um, so I should, I should keep track of those patients, but I, I guess I would say without having any, any clear data that I've tracked over time, Anecdotally, it's probably pretty close to 50-50, a little bit of horizontal, a little bit of one to two degrees per second of a little bit of geotropic or apogeotropic um, without symptoms or with some symptoms that are just aggravated, not triggered by dixalpike or sapine roll, uh, but definitely some upbeat, definitely some downbeat as well. So it's, it's a mix and it's, it's unpredictable. And, and in my experience, it can kind of be anything. So um, the other thing, get, getting back to Erica's question about the patient with a sudden sensory neural hearing loss and vertigo and the fact that it was geotropic, geotropic in general, when you see that, that that's pretty reassuring. It's pretty rare, pretty uncommon to have um, a, a geotropic central positional nystagmus unless it's related to a, a paraflocculus problem. But if it was related to a paraflocculus problem, typically you have a lot of gaze evoked and you have really psychotic pursuit. So um, apogeotropic is, is typically more concerning, much more concerning than geotropic if you're considering a, a central etiology. But for migraine all over the place, I mean, we've seen patients in the emergency department with migraine, we've seen upbeat, we've seen downbeat, we've seen downbeat torsional and uh, pretty much everything. But, but again, it is a diagnosis of exclusion and those patients, you definitely want to make sure that, that you're not overlooking something else. I had mentioned that interictally between migraine attacks, a lot of patients will have, in my experience, a little bit. Of, of, of jiggling with Dixal Pike or Supine Roll. And again, it can be anything. Typically that's gonna be a lot more during an attack of vestibular migraine. Positional nystagmus during an attack of vestibular migraine is really common. Um, and that has been, has been um, written about. So de definitely look out for that and be aware of that. Okay, well, the other day I had this patient who looks like a positional case. I tried to make some maneuvers didn't work. And I thought, I saw his um, right ear was uh, a chronic ot otitis, chronic thing. And I said, it can be, it doesn't look like a labyrinthine infection, acute labyrinthitis. So next day he came back, he was just the same, nothing improved. And I said, okay, I'm gonna give him antibiotics locally and orally. And he came back the next day and he said, I'm just fine in a couple of hours. I have no, no dizziness at all. So I look at him and everything, everything positional nystagmus that I was seeing, all kind of positional nystagmus went away. It's, it's the only case I had, but it, I thought it was it's very uh, interesting because 
Finally, the thing is, what is really happening with the vestibular system when we make the position of this? Mm -hmm. is, is it only autoconia or what is physiologically happening when you don't have a, an autoconial debris, but some things are happening in there and we, we really don't, don't I, I don't understand what is happening, but it's given symptoms and signs that we are seeing in, in not only for autoconial debridements. Right. I agree. And, and again, if, if I'm not sure about what's going on, I will see them back. Um, I will follow them closely or make sure that somebody's following them closely. And by seeing these patients back, when you're, you're not sure what's going on, by seeing them back, you learn a lot and you'll be able to help the patients as well and, and hopefully make the diagnosis um, the, the second or third time you do the dick salt bike or the spinal right. bike. And, right. and things look things look different and things can become much clearer. So I, I would definitely recommend that to follow these patients closely when you're not sure. And also I just yeah. want to comment that Dr. Silva has also passed and is, is a nice stagmologist. Um, she sent me a video of a patient she diagnosed <laughs> with a, a cerebellar stroke that she identified and made sure that he didn't he didn't herniate and uh, and, and die at home. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the last one, last one is what do you do with your um, horizontal jam cases? Do you use the vibrator? Do, those, mm -hmm. uh, just, do they work? I mean, I don't have one. I'm trying to get one. Um, I, I'm asking my husband to buy me this stuff because I'm, I, I'm not really <laughs> sure how to invest. But which did you use it? I mean, is, is it good for the jam case, cases? So you're talking about a canal jam? Right, horizontal, right. which yep. are the most difficult. Yeah, so um, so if it's, I've only, I've seen two patients with, with what I was convinced was sort of a canal jam. So um, a, a, an otoconia that was sort of lodged in one canal to the point where it was completely occluding the canal. Um, and one of those pa patients, I, I think I, I did a repositioning maneuver for posterior canal or for horizontal canal, I can't remember which. And then um, the otoconia, I think it was posterior canal, the otoconia dislodged from the posterior canal presumably, but then wound up causing a canal jam in the horizontal canal. And then all of a sudden he had spontaneous nystagmus and was sort of yelling at me. And so, um, I, sh I should have done some head impulses. I should have done something, but I just decided to shake his head <laughs> to do a, a head shaking maneuver and it immediately cleared up. Yeah. That was the first patient. The second patient had definite horizontal canal BPPV and our technician was doing a video head impulse on him. And at, with one of the head impulses, that otoconia that was sitting in the horizontal canal that we knew was affected um, wound up getting occluding the canal with one of the head impulses, and all of a sudden he developed a spontaneous nystagmus, and then um, 10 seconds later it just stopped. So I, I guess that it, it sort of resolved itself. So I don't know. Um, with one single patient, I was able to to cure it uh, with with a therapeutic head shaking maneuver, um, but maybe some combination if it's really stubborn of vibration plus head shaking to just to try to get things moving. Um, okay, have you, have you had, have you had a patient with a canal jam that lasted for a significant period of time? No, 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 uh, no, maybe, I, no, maybe I'm not talking about, I, I meant the cupulolithiasis cases, those oh, long lasting cupulolithiasis cases. Got that you, you work and they improve uh, partially and they and you yep. insist and so you apply the vibrator with the with the help i mean in my my idea is that those, those debris are some kind of integrated to the cupola somehow and you cannot get them out i, I that's what i meant got it okay so um so yes i, I use a vibrator as well for those cases there's no great evidence that a vibrator is better than no vibrator, but it makes sense, right? If it's if right. it's ad adherent to the cupola, then it makes sense that it, it could work. It could be just enough to sort of, to, to get the otoconia moving so that you can liberate the canal. Um, but there's no, there's no robust evidence out there to say that this is how we should vibrate. We should vibrate for this long, and this is exactly right. what we should be doing. So okay, it, it doesn't exist yet. Uh, and, oh, not, not that I'm aware of. 
Thank you very much. Yep. I have Thank a little question, so. but I wait my next turn. Yes, let, let's um, give uh, Mireya Ramirez, Dr. Mireya Ramirez, uh, the voice to, to say her comment or question. Yes, good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Gold, for your nice lecture. Um, I would like to ask you, I have a patient with downbeat nystagmus in the Dix Hall pipe maneuver, and uh, his MRI is completely normal. Uh, I did many times the Jacobino maneuver, but it doesn't work. Uh, what would you do? Uh, would you use uh, some kind of medicine to help him? Yeah, so what, what are the symptoms? Um, what, why is the patient seeing you? Is it for positional dizziness or vertigo or is yes. it for imbalance? Positional dizziness, positional dizziness. Yes, it, it, it's, it's a BPPV, it's a downbeat nystagmus that uh, comes out with the Dix Hall pipe maneuver with uh, his head hung, hanging. Mm -hmm. Got it. So is it is it exactly the same in right Dix Hall pike and left Dix Hall pike? The left right, the left side is more evident. Okay, but it's still to the right. Yes, too. Okay, we, and yes. is it is it is it crescendo decrescendo? Is there a latency, or does it just kind of keep going? Uh, it has a little latency. It comes and it 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 goes the downbeat, and it lasts less than a minute and disappears. Yeah. It's, it's the only symptom, and I did everything, <laughs> and right. everything is normal. Yeah, th those are tough cases, right? So if there's a, a, a downbeat and a torsional component, like I said, that that might be a little bit. If it was a downbeat in torsion and it had a latency and it was crescendo decrescendo, then then I would definitely um, think that it was probably a, a sort of a posterior canal apogeotropic short arm variant versus could this be an anterior canal variant? Although if it is an anterior canal variant, um, theoretically, it shouldn't be so hard to treat. It shouldn't persist because of the orientation of the anterior canal. Um, I see a lot of patients with positional nystagmus, uh, positional downbeat rather. And again, because I'm a neurologist, I see a lot of neurological patients and a lot of those patients have cerebellar dysfunction. So I would look very closely to see if there's any gaze evokes, to see if there's any psychotic pursuit to see if, um, if what their, their gait looks like. Is there anything that might localize the cerebellum? Um, I've seen okay. patients who kind of start with a little bit of a positional downbeat and then over years um, clearly sort of fall into the bucket of kind of a, a cerebellar degenerative disorder. Um, and that was sort of a presenting sign. So again, I, I would try to uh, work what I would do is sort of work with a, a, a my neighborhood um, knowledgeable vestibular physical therapist and um, to, to have some positional maneuvers done and to try a couple different treatments for posterior canal, maybe for anterior canal. And if that doesn't work, just follow the patient closely and see what happens next. It sounds like yeah. you've done the most important test, which is an MRI. I agree. Any any unclear positional downbeat, especially one that's persistent, that doesn't go away, definitely get an MRI. So yes. I would just kind of watch and see what happens. If, yes. if it's definitely cerebellar, if it's definitely a cerebellar positional downbeat, there are some case reports out there on medications that might be helpful, but there's yes. no strong evidence for, for any okay. one medication over another. I saw- I have I'm sorry, the, the patient the patient who uh, I showed in the, the nystagmus lecture who had positional downbeat, pretty strong positional downbeat, um, when she was upright, she also had a little bit of downbeat and lateral gaze, mm. and, and she had a cerebellopathy, and mm. she responded dramatically to 4 So Yes, that her, I, I was going to tell you that, uh, yep. 4 aminopyridine. Yep. So her positional downbeat improved substantially with formenopyridine. She was very mm -hmm. happy. But in that case, again, she clearly had a cerebellar degeneration. Um, in okay. your case, it sounds like it's not so clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, 
we're going to give the chance to Dr. Marta Valdivia. Okay, thank you very much. Congratulations for the best lecture, Dr. Daniel Gold. It's thank a you. pleasure to be here. And I want to ask you about, uh, in all the lectures that I listen about the periodic alternate uh, nystagmus, always uh, talk about the time that it's important mm -hmm. and always talk about 90 or 120 seconds. But when you um, watch some uh, nystagmus that change and the spontaneous nystagmus change uh, the direction in 10 seconds uh, and you, you're you looking the nystagmus some uh, 10 seconds uh, beating to the right and 10 seconds to the left. You consider that is a periodic alternate nystagmus or not? Mm -hmm. Right, so that that is still technically periodic alternating nystagmus and there's such thing as a short cycle periodic alternating nystagmus as well. So it doesn't have to be 90 to 120 seconds, but that's most common. Um, but like I said, there are other conditions that can technically cause sort of a periodic alternating nystagmus, and some of those are, are peripheral as well. Anything that causes somebody has a right beating that all of a sudden transitions to a left beating um, and then transitions back can be a PAN, and it doesn't have to be 90 to 120 seconds. It's just most common. That's why we always talk about that. Thank you very much. Yep. It's so great there. Everybody is very eager to participate. We're all graduating from this class, or so we're very happy. There's another question I, from. I Dr. wish I had it. I wish I had a graduation certificate to give you. To <laughs> that would be so great. Um, with the book with your signature. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, I have this question from Dr. Jesus Martinez Elizondo. He's saying, uh, "Have you seen?" Uh, uh, cerebellitis, no, cerebellitis, can you say that, or some uh, pathology from the cerebellum uh, due to COVID-19, COVID-19, do you think, have you seen any alteration in the cerebellum in the clinic? Uh, right, so I personally haven't. I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if any of my, my colleagues who do more of um, on the inpatient side have, mm -hmm. but um, COVID can affect lots of different parts of the brain, so it certainly certainly uh, would be understandable if the cerebellum can be affected. Uh, I don't know, um, we have many people here, audiologists, uh, neurotologists, and, and so so uh, so more. Um, I have seen some patients with Meniere disease post-COVID. I don't know if anyone here has seen patients with Meniere disease post-COVID, Dr. Toledo. I have seen, I have, I don't know, two or three patients with Meniere starting post COVID, but I don't know if that is due to COVID or they just started simultaneously by some reason. Yes, no, I don't have any case of Meniere's in COVID patient, in the same patient. Yes. I had some kinds of vestibular neuritis after having COVID. Okay. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you, Dr. Toledo. Um, uh, there was a question about positional down stamus, but I think we have kind of covered that out. Um, there are a lot of uh, congratulations. The videos are wonderful. Uh, Dr. Claudia Silva, you have another question pending. Yes. Yes, I give you the voice. The, okay. Um, you so many, no, for COVID, I've just seen a lot more of um, uh, positional, I mean, BBBV cases, a lot people from three months or three months in the use and the intensive care units, uh, a lot of positional nystagmus and I mean for BBBV and mostly horizontal uh, canal um, mainly. And the other question is for uh, square weight jerks, for the, um, do they give any symptoms in uh, the elderly or in Parkinson uh, patients? Do you think that, do they feel anything about this um, eye movement uh, uh, signs? No, so uh, square wave jerks um, are almost always asymptomatic. Okay. 
I've seen one patient who was really symptomatic from their square waves, and um, they they really benefited from clonazepam, a benzodiazepine. Uh, but otherwise, it, it tends to be asymptomatic. As you said, it's common with Parkinson's disease or, or PSP, progressive supranuclear palsy. Those patients have other little eye movement abnormalities. They have hypometric saccades. They have saccadic pursuit. They have dry eyes. They have convergence insufficiencies. So it's also a little challenging to tease out um, which of those is responsible. Probably it's sort of a combination of everything, right? If you're trying to read and, and lots of patients with Parkinson's or PSP complain of reading difficulties or have a lot of visual symptoms, is some of that um, related to their square waves? Uh, maybe, but if it is, it's really, it's really to a very minor degree. Um, okay. And it's, it's interesting that you mentioned about horizontal canal BBPV in, um, in COVID patients, patients who are in the ICU, um, and in, in your respective country. So in the United States, they're doing a lot of prone positioning for these patients. Yes. Um, I wonder if that has anything to do with, with uh, getting it sort of some otoconia stuck in the, the horizontal canals more than you might expect in somebody who's been in the ICU for a while. Right. And for the masticatory neorrhythmia that you mentioned, what is exactly that? What, what is the symptom? What do, they, what do they complain about? Yeah, so that it's extremely common. I've never seen a case of that. Um, uh -huh. oculo, oculo masticatory myorrhythmia and Whipple's disease. So Whipple's disease, they have pendular and nystagmus, that's sort of convergent, divergent. Mm -hmm. I've never seen a case. It's extremely okay. rare. If you if you do a Google search for mm -hmm. oculomasticatory myarrhythmia, you're probably only going to find one video. Um, it's the same. <laughs> it's the okay. same video that's been used for the last thirty years um, because there's just not much else oh, great, out there. Great. Um, Maybe that's what the cat had and nobody cared. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, so and those patients tend to have a lot of um, a lot of uh, GI symptoms as well. Let me here we here we go. Let me share my screen. This okay. is a, this is from somebody else's collection um, from I think Dr. Shirley Ray, who's who's sort of the I guess you could call her the the grandmother of uh, of neuroophthalmology. And let me just share my screen here. I'll show you what oculomasticatory myarrhythmia looks like. And again, this is the, the example that's used over and over and over because there's not much else out there. Mm -hmm. oh. So this convergent divergent. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well. And you can see his mouth moving too. Mm -hmm. That's pretty clear. But I thought that when the patient uh, chew, it, it um, uh, produces the eye. Right, that's what I, I thought. No, it's, it's the opposite. Uh, I'm sorry, I said that again. Sorry, I was, I was trying to stop the, I, I, I kept hearing her talking over me. It's just a, there is a synchrony between the eyes and the, the, the masticatory movement. It's not mm -hmm. that people chew and then they have the movement. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank no, you. No, it's spontaneous. Um, well, I have just something as last question. Um, I want to know more about bronze nystagmus. Is this always from the uh, cerebellopatine angle tumor, or can it be in the ventricle, or what would be the the um, you know the pathophysiology or the the cause of the bronze nystagmus, and how how can you define it very clearly? Because for me, it's very hard to grasp the definition of bronze. Right. So the definition would just simply be using vestibular nystagmus in one direction and then gaze evoked in the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, but let me let me find here are some figures from my book. Uh, let me just share my screen here. So I guess I would say that the the other most common place uh, to have a Bruins nystagmus is is in the medulla. So if you right, if the, the, the horizontal canal afferents 
um, are going to go to the, the medial vestibular nucleus and the, the subnuclei of the vestibular nucleus, right? So the, the MVN here. And so um, on that basis, if you affect those vestibular afferents, the horizontal canal afferents, not peripherally in the ear, but centrally in the medulla, then you can have what looks like a peripheral vestibular nystagmus, although at that point it's technically a central vestibular nystagmus, but it can look exactly the same. So if you affect um, the, the one side of the medulla, you can get a vestibular nystagmus to the opposite side, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be as if, if there's a right vestibular neuritis, that left beating nystagmus can look the same if you had a right medullary lesion and you're affecting those same afferent fibers. Does that make sense? Yes. But because oh. the, the medial vestibular nucleus and the NPH, the nucleus for positive hypoglossi, these two structures are the, the horizontal neural integrators, the horizontal gaze holding machinery, you can also have gaze evoked. Um, and if you affect NVN and NPH, um, on one side, you'll get more gaze evoked on that side than gaze evoked in the opposite side. So if you had a medullary lesion, you could have ipsy lesional, ipsilateral gaze evoked nystagmus due to involvement of the NPH MDN. And you could have vestibular nystagmus, contralateral, contralesional uh, vestibular nystagmus based on the fact that you're affecting these horizontal canal afferents um, on, the, on the right side as well. So that's another common cause for Bruhn's nystagmus, um, a medullary lesion. Um, is the ventricle um, a cause of Bruhn's nystagmus or is it more in the cerebellar pontine angle? Yeah. It's, it's, I, I kind of heard, hmm. I mean, I kind of read one time, like a long time ago, that there was, if you have, for example, uh, neurocystis psychosis and you can just go to the ventricle and it will just block the ventricle and then unblock the ventricle. I mean, go up and down, it could give bronze nystagmus. I don't know if that's true. I, I kind of read it like a long time ago. It's just, right. I was just wondering if this could, could happen if a partial obstruction of a ventricle could give a bronze nystagmus. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think maybe that was a specific case report and that particular patient with mm -hmm. neurocystic sure. cirrhosis had Bruns nystagmus, uh, but I, I wouldn't never heard of sort of a hydrocephalus or a, a blocked mm -hmm. ventricle causing that okay. by itself. So Thank you so this, much. Yes. And this, this evoke nystagmus um, uh, is, is because of the... Um, uh, medial vestibular nucleus and the proposito hypoglossal nuclear affect, um, are affected, which is a lot less common than gaze evoked nystagmus because of the flocular and paraflocular lesion, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, right. Maybe yeah. it's the rare cases when gaze evoked is uh, from the, the brainstem and not the cerebellum. That's correct. So Jisoo Kim mm -hmm. has written a lot of papers about these different brainstem and cerebellar syndromes, the acute vestibular syndrome. What happens if you have a vestibular nucleus stroke? What happens if you have a stroke that just affects the NPH? Mm -hmm. What happens if you have a stroke that just affects um, um, the paraflocculus? So there, there are case reports out there on uh, strategically sort of having a stroke that involves a very small area and what does that exam look like? But you're right, it's very rare. It would be much more common for a patient to have sort of flocculus, paraflocculus, a vestibulocerebellar syndrome, a, a neurodegenerative um, cerebellar ataxia, much more common than to have a, a little NPH stroke, for instance. Thank you. Dr. Toledo. I don't know, you want, you want to comment on that something? Um, Dr. Pinto, we were, it's, it's, well, it's over an hour of questions. Um, do you want to make a, like a little ceremony of graduation? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for, for the lecture, Daniel. Thank you for the team, for everything uh, they prepare the subtitles, they prepare the question, they prepare everything, okay? So it has been a, 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 a very nice course. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about the, the, 
the history or the story of this uh, course. Uh, it started last year when we talked with Daniel about uh, we need the uh, help, a uh, big support in order to learn uh, central nervous system vestibular disorders uh, problems. And uh, he offered to help us to learn. And we talk about a program, we talk about the best program. And I promised him to have the best course uh, of central nervous system uh, and this is worldwide. And I believe we accomplish this, uh, this idea, this goal, because uh, uh, we really have uh, uh, a very nice course with uh, Daniel and his team, and he helped us a lot. And this information is available for whatever people worldwide. Okay, so I'm very happy and I'm very proud about the team, about the Latin American team, about what we really done, okay? It's very important we to believe we are a very formal group. It means uh, we, uh, we, we did our best in order to, to get the best course. So uh, we don't have uh, nothing to give you, Daniel, in order to, to, to say thanks, okay? I do believe there is no words to, to, to express this thing, but probably our patients will be uh, beneficiated with uh, the knowledge you share with us. So probably you are going to, to have in the future uh, some uh, experience with uh, the people that we are promised to share with you in order you can realize it was, uh, uh, it was um, an effort for you and for your team uh, that was necessary and important, okay? So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to share with you uh, a small uh, certificate, okay? I don't know if you can see it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> this now, is a certificate for we really appreciate your. That's great. Are, your, are, are you going to send that to me, or do I have to take a screenshot? Oh, I'm going. We are going to send you, of course. All right, sounds good. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Uh, we we always have the help of Dr. Monica Davila from Costa Rica, and here you can see in the background the image of the course. And here is uh, dedicated with uh, in, a, in, in a very special dedication for you. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, as a tradition of our course, we usually give the word uh, to the speaker. So you have uh, uh, now the the word, Daniel, in order you can close the, the um, this uh, this course. Sounds Please good. Well, thank. Thanks so much. Like I said, it's been an honor and a privilege to uh, to, to, the, to attend, to present, um, to, to attempt to share my knowledge and uh, acquire knowledge from each of you. And um, thanks to everyone who, who organized and put these together as well. It's been great. And um, I, I agree. I mean, this, the, like I, I've said this a, a bunch of times, but even for neurologists, this is really, really challenging. All of these concepts that we're talking about are really, really challenging. So I think that um, you, you guys are all officially nice diagnologists, and <laughs> I, I think that you, you are much more accomplished now than 99.99% than, uh, of the people in the United States when it comes to central vestibular disorders, and um, it's, it's been a pleasure. So thanks for, for spending these Saturdays um, with, with me and with my team, and it's... Um, uh, like I said, I, I hope to meet everybody in, in person one day. Okay, be sure, be sure we are going to uh, we are going to meet personally. Okay, okay. Well, uh, Erica, please. Uh, uh, um, I, I want to request you uh, your last comments in order uh, you can 
I don't know, you can share with us your opinion and how do you feel? Especially how well, do you thank you so much. Uh, it's been such a wonderful experience. I have learned so much. As I mentioned in the last patient, I have actually made my clinic a lot better. I just, this knowledge is going to go back to my patients. You're going to see patients um, here in Mexico or Latin America better treated. We're going to look and we're going to see those videos again and again and again, because one time is not enough. It's going to take us more times and more to see your, to read your book also to get more knowledge. But um probably that patient that I saw and so many patients, the new patients that I have this year after these talks, I could never get that diagnosis. I mean, I could just say that she was, she had another thing or she was stressed out or it was BBBB or it was something else. So now I have all these tools to make uh, better the life of my patients. So this, this is, is invaluable. I mean, this, there's no, I mean, um, the effort you put into this course and your team um, has, uh, it's invaluable. I mean, we are truly thankful. We have uh, learned a lot. I mean, all of us are so, so happy to be here. And we're gonna miss, we wanna miss this course. We wanna miss you. We wanna miss all your team. We are. Um, we wanna see those videos again every time we get homesick. And so thank you so much. We're gonna look forward for your book. Thank you, thank you in the name of Vestibular Central Nervous System uh, Group here in Latin America. We are hopeful to see it, to keep um, reading, to keep being a, an active group. It's gonna take us for a lot of effort because now we have so many patients now because it's uh, everything is so open. Right. Now with um, COVID, it's, it's slowing down, but we really, really want to keep uh, moving on this, on this new knowledge you, you gave us and Thank you. There's no words like Dr. Pinto said to express all that we feel. Thank you in the name of Latin American group, Gene Gino Latam. Thank you. That, that would be all. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's uh, very gratifying to hear. I really appreciate it. Um, so go out there and save some lives. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. Absolutely. Bye bye. See you. Bye. All right. Stay, bye. Stay, in, Thank you. stay in touch. <laughs> all right. Take care. Okay. Okay, bye bye. Uh, si alguien quiere quedarse en la reunión.